This is CBC Here and Now. The best way to honor Paula would be to create a trust fund in her daughter's name. Classmates come together after tragedy strikes. Kicked out, the Herder champions can't play in the Avalon Senior Hockey League. Classic cars crisscrossing the country ride into Cupid's. A long weekend is here, of course, and some shower chances for most, especially as we roll into the Saturday time period. A great day Sunday. Rain rolls back in for Monday. We'll have a full recap coming up. Well, the class of 2000 at Clarenville High has been drawn together once again, this time for tragedy. A group of alumni has launched a fundraising campaign in support of a 13-year-old girl left orphaned by a devastating vehicle crash. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. More than 120 students graduated from this school 17 years ago. Well, now the loss of one of their own has pulled them together once again. Six days ago, head-on collision on the TCH. Four dead, including Michael and Paula Ryan and their young son, Michael Jr. Absent in the vehicle that day was a fourth member of the family, Rachel Ryan, just 13. Now faced with a future without her parents and only sibling. Rachel is going to do wonderful in life. She has so much support. Part of that support is coming from Paula's former classmates. They have launched a fundraising blitz in her honor with the money to be put into a trust fund for Rachel. She was a vibrant personality, a very big personality. You know, if you were in her company, she made it known. And uh, yeah, she was a real firecracker, but I have good memories of her and think she was an awesome person and definitely an amazing mother. The goal was 20,000 over two months, but that's already in sight after just two days. I cannot even thank my fellow classmates enough for what they are doing for Rachel. Paula Vivian Ryan may be gone, but it's obvious she's touched many in her young life. Her old classmates believe Rachel will carry on that legacy. She is going to carry on like her mother would want her to do. She's going to be a strong little girl and she's going to grow into a beautiful, beautiful adult, just like her mom. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Clarenville. There's also been a fundraiser that started for the family of 18-year-old Sarah Stride. The teen was in the other vehicle involved in Sunday's two-car crash on the TCH. According to a GoFundMe account, the Stride, Sarah Stride Memorial Fund has already raised more than half of its $10,000 goal. Stride's funeral was set to take place today in Lewisport. Well, dozens have put their names forward, hoping to become councillors in the city of Cornerbrook. But two are standing out. Kyle Brookings is one of the youngest candidates in the province, while Priscilla uh, Boutier is the oldest. Here and now's Colleen Connors explains how these two very different campaigns have very different tactics. It's election season in Cornerbrook, and 18 candidates are vying for six councillor seats. But two stand out. Kyle Brookings, he's 25, and he wants to change the city. Certainly I have some ideas that haven't been heard before. I have some new ideas for the city of Cornerbrook. So I think I would certainly bring, you know, you know, some fresh ideas, some new ideas to Cornerbrook that maybe we haven't seen before. Priscilla Butcher is in her 80s, and she's got more than 20 years punched with city politics. You really need experience, and I think that it helps because I know I've been there, and when you're young and you come in, you're going to change all this, you're going to do all the roads and all this, but it doesn't, doesn't happen that way. The oldest and the youngest have very different campaigns. Well, uh, I'm very active on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. I have a website. I have my uh, personal cell phone number out there and, uh, you know, the good old-fashioned going door-to-door -door and asking for people's support. Butcher has a different, more traditional approach. Well, I'm not on social media and I, I think that uh, uh, signs, like, sure, I'll have some signs, but I don't think signs on social media get you elected. You know, the people, you, you're going to meet them face-to-face -face and know, know you, eh? Both candidates have until the end of the month to work their strategies and pull votes. And there's a chance they could be sitting together in the council chambers. Will the youngest candidate take the vote with all his new ideas? Or will the oldest candidate win with all of her experience? Well, we'll have to wait and see. The vote is on September 26th. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. 
Meanwhile, the mayor of Clarenville isn't thrilled about how he inherited the job. Fraser Russell won the race by acclamation, as did the six other men who will make up the new council. That means there'll be no women sitting on council and five of its members are retired. Russell says Clarenville will have to work on recruiting more young people and women to be candidates in the future. There was also no race for the mayor's job in Conception Bay South. Former MHA Terry French got the job by acclamation. French was elected to the House as a PC member back in 2002. He had a number of cabinet portfolios, including tourism and justice. He'll be taking over for former mayor Steve Tessier, who announced earlier this year he wouldn't seek re-election. Well, another senior hockey team in Newfoundland is on the verge of folding, but it's not by choice. The Harbour Grace CB Stars received a letter this week saying they've been kicked out of the Avalon East Senior Hockey League. Here now's Ryan Cook explains. The arena here in Harbour Grace is a buzz today with minor hockey age kids at a hockey camp. Now with senior hockey in jeopardy, they may be the only hockey tenants here this winter. The CBs are the reigning Herder Cup champions, but the Avalon Senior League doesn't want them, and the CBs don't know why. We've got no indication in any way, shape or form as to why we are being kicked out of the uh, league. You guys seen the letter, that is all that we have. In this letter signed by executives of the four other teams in the league, the CBs are told they will not be allowed to return. It was attached to an email sent by St. John's Caps president Jack Casey, which said the CBs were too different than the other teams. Yankees are different than the A's. Toronto Maple Leafs are different than the Florida Panthers. I don't know what they mean. Uh, if it's because we generate more fans and have a bigger community base, that's the only differences that I can see as of today. Nobody from the league was available for an interview on Friday. Meanwhile, rumors are circulating online about the team being banished for paying its players, something illegal under the league's constitution. Reynolds wants to put those rumors to rest. In no way, shape or form do we pay any players. It's not only hockey that's been cut. The CBs have been running a community Chase the Ace fundraiser, but the license for the draw was issued to the league and not the team. Service NL has notified them they must cease the draw by September 10th, even though there will be 12 cards left in the deck and even though the draw also benefits two local charities. We got a lot of people pretty upset about that and to me it's just a, another sign that there's definitely something personal and you know showing as to how low these guys have, have been treating us. The CBs have reached out to Hockey NL to intervene, but it's unclear if they have the authority to overrule the decision. They may be welcome in the Central West Senior Hockey League, but say they won't go. They just want to play on the Avalon at home. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Harbor Grace. Late this afternoon, a league executive reached out to here and now. Jack Casey, president of the St. John's Cap, says the CBs are too advanced to play in the Avalon League. And despite the CBs denying it, there is a belief in the hockey community that certain players would not have played for the CBs without being paid. Well, thousands of Muslims in this province are celebrating Eid today. It's known as the Feast of Sacrifice. And thanks to the federal government, the province's only mosque will soon get funding for a new security program meant to protect against hate crimes. The $46,000 announcement was made at an Eid service at the Sheridan Hotel in St. John's today. The money will be used to install gates and fencing, secure windows, and improve security. MP Nick Whalen says the measures will make the community safer and bring greater peace of mind. The federal government plans to spend $10 million over the next five years as part of a Communities at Risk program designed to help groups that could be the target of hate crimes. Well, tonight, police are investigating a jailhouse death after a man died on Thursday inside Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. The CBC's Ariana Kelland is following this story. She joins us live from the newsroom. So, Ariana, what's the latest that we know? Well, we know that correctional officers found the inmate early yesterday. Officials aren't saying much tonight, but this is what we do know. He was 38 years old and the father to two young children. It was his first time in jail, and it's suspected that he died by suicide in a cell alone. Justice officials say, say that the RNC is investigating the sudden death, but they aren't saying much else other than that it takes all incidents inside its correctional facilities very seriously. 
Meanwhile, the chief medical examiner is working to determine the cause of death. Peter? Thank you very much. That's the CBC's Arianna Kellen live with us tonight. Police are asking anyone who witnessed a stabbing in downtown St. John's early this morning to come forward. The RNC says the incident happened on George Street around 3.15 a.m. Three people were injured in the knife assault and at least one was stabbed. It's not known what condition that person is in. Police believe someone may have recorded the incident with their smartphone. Anyone with information is asked to contact the major crimes unit. Well, we're heading into the last long weekend of the summer and no doubt people will want to make the most of it. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't get behind the wheel under the influence. And that's the message coming from police, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation. They set up a checkpoint on the border between St. John's and Bay Bulls. Here now is Glenn Payett checked it out. This is all about bringing awareness about the dangers of impaired driving. Um, it's a safety road check and it's about stopping someone from driving while they're impaired by drugs or alcohol. So we have Mad Cannon here as well, a little gift for you for your cell phone. This is, you have the counter wrappers on your phone there. So. Hi, here you go. I'm with Mad Cannon. We just want to thank you for not driving while you're impaired by drugs or alcohol. And if you suspect an impaired driver, call 911. This lady's with Mad. She just got a little something there for you. So this is a mad ribbon and a credit card holder that I can attach to your phone and it's just a reminder to please drink responsibly. Do you think most people understand how stiff the penalties are for drinking and driving? No, I think the general public are thinking that it's just a slap on the wrist. Well, what we have coming in, of course, is vehicle impoundment. Um, anyone who's picked up or uh, hit 0.5, if you blow the breathalyzer, get 0.5, then, of course, you will then have uh, your immediate suspension of your license, but you'll also lose your vehicle for a minimum of seven days for your first offense. And, of course, that means that you will have to pay the tow fee. You will then have to pay the impoundment fee for seven days. So that's extremely, extremely expensive, and it's going to hit hit people in the pocketbook. Your next offense will cost you 30 days. You will without your vehicle and again all the fees will go back to you. The biggest thing is to just bring more awareness to impaired driving which uh, there's still a lot of people out there who just really aren't getting that message. This afternoon we're doing uh, roadside checks, checking for sobriety whether it's by alcohol, yep. drugs, illegal uh, medication or illegal drugs or anything like that. We're also here with MAD. They're presenting some tokens and information about MAD. What, what kind of response are you getting from the drivers? We're getting a, a very good response uh, saying that uh, they're supporting uh, what we're doing here and uh, get the message, message. There you go, that's the word. Get the mad message out and uh, well, everybody's supporting it. Well, there's another lottery winner to tell you about tonight and no, 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 it doesn't involve Chase the Ace. A woman from Paradise has won one and a half million dollars on a scratch and win ticket. Here is Janice Henstridge of Paradise picking up her check this afternoon. She's the winner of Atlantic Lottery's Super Set for Life. She had the option of accepting $100,000 a year or choosing a lump sum of $1.5 million. What in your life will change now that you're super set for life? Um, to be mortgage free, car payment free, Debt free and be able to take a family vacation to Florida during Christmas, which is something I've always wanted Sweet. to do. We'll stick around up next. We're going to take you out on the water and follow a pod of porpoises as they race alongside a boat just off the shoreline of Grand Bay.
Welcome back. And before we get to the weather, and I know everyone's looking for a long weekend forecast. Yep. Some people will be headed out on boat. But let's take a look at this. It's amazing video taken by a family off Brunette, wow. which is near Grand Bay. Yeah, this pod of porpoises gliding alongside them is uh, quite the sight. Yeah, that, this uh, Jennifer Brinston captured the whole thing on video while her young son, he's the one you can sort of hear it squealing in the background. It's not the porpoises. <laughs> yeah, there, <laughs> there he is. There he is. Uh, but uh, yeah, amazing to, and so clear the water there. Yeah. Being able to, I'd be afraid I'd hit them, but I guess the porpoises know what they're doing. Uh, yeah, the porpoises are, I think, are better drivers than the boat drivers. <laughs> but uh, fantastic video. Thanks for sharing. That's also up on our Facebook page if you want to take a closer look at that. Uh, boy, what a overnight and in through to, uh, this morning in Western Labrador, Peter. Uh, not completely out of the, uh, you know, out of the, out of, uh, the norm to see a bit of snow around this time of year, but when it actually falls in the month of August, yeah, it's a little tough uh, pill to swallow. Uh, Mervyn McDonald says, uh, quote, my dad is really enjoying his summer vacation with us here in Labrador City. Well, at least you made a little snowman there, you know, getting yeah. in the spirit of it. Absolutely. And, of course, that snow only accumulated to basically what you see there, enough to uh, bring a little trace or a coating on uh, some of the roads and the, uh, the grass and the bushes, but not much sticking around today uh, as uh, things have changed over to rain. And that is going to be the main story as we move forward. And it'll be particularly southeastern Labrador and the northern peninsula where we have rainfall warnings in effect. And as we take a look at the future precip, this is definitely going to be the bullseye uh, through the day on Saturday by the time we get to Sunday morning. This will be the corridor of moisture that's going to be setting up. Happy Valley Goose Bay perhaps in the 10 to 20 millimeter range, but we could see upwards of 50 millimeter potential for the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. Uh, a bit of steadier precip along the west coast tonight in and through tomorrow as well. It's all thanks to uh, we have our first low taking off and a new low developing here, and that is going to be swinging in. Uh, from southwest to northeast and that corridor of moisture is really just going to start to set up. You can already see some of the banding taking place that's shooting up through Cornerbrook over the last few hours and other bands over the northern peninsula as we speak. And the, in fact, the GOES-16 visible satellite really shows that corridor of moisture lining up nicely here from the northern peninsula and into southeastern parts of Labrador. And that will continue to set itself up over the next uh, 24 to 36 hours. And hopefully my uh, computer is going to cooperate here. We have, uh, I'll make sure I try and get to the next scene. As we, uh, as I mentioned, this is the next line that's been slowly but surely making its way up through Cornerbrook to the Northern Peninsula and into southeastern parts of Labrador. That's where we're going to be seeing that rain really taking shape. Uh, and that's where we could end up with upwards of 50 millimeters by the time we get mainly to the end of the day on Saturday perhaps a little bit more in the way of accumulation overnight Saturday and in through Sunday. Roddy, I may have a, a complete system freeze here. As you can see, that satellite's not moving. Three, ah, there we go, okay. That was close. Uh, can you see the sweat stains? It was getting close. Uh, now for Saturday morning, you can see where there's the precip still hanging out northern peninsula and over southeastern parts of Labrador back towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. Just one in Labrador City, so another cool start tomorrow morning, but hey, no snow, so not too bad. Now, along the west coast of the island, we've got some periods of rain. Risk of some thunderstorms to start the day tomorrow. A little bit for Cornerbrook, but more so from Port of Basque across to the Buren Peninsula and a scattered risk of a shower in uh, St. John's uh, looking at just partly cloudy skies across central Newfoundland. And that band of moisture will then wrap back into central Newfoundland with some pretty steady shower chances. For the Avalon, it's scattered shower chances and a risk of some thunderstorms into the afternoon, especially just before that wind shift. We'll go from southwest winds tomorrow through the day. That'll keep our temperature up around 16 degrees. And then around late afternoon in through the supper time hour, we're going to shift and those winds will become west and then northwest. And that'll have our temperatures dropping for Saturday night. And again, along that line is where we have a pretty good risk of uh, seeing a thunderstorm. So yeah, scattered in nature uh, will be those shower chances for the eastern half of the island tomorrow, but there'll certainly be on the menu. The best chance uh, right through the day tomorrow will be from Clarenville back in through uh, central and over towards the west coast. And again, with that northerly wind, 
just 13 degrees for Corner Brook, Stephenville, a little bit shielded along that south coast, but basically we're in the 13 to 16 degree range for much of the island tomorrow. 10 for the northern peninsula and through the southeast. Happy Valley Goose Bay, bit of lingering shower activity through Cartwright as well, but clearing into the afternoon and some sunshine in western parts of Labrador and up towards the north coast. Long range details Sunday, Monday and beyond coming up, Peter. Thanks, Ryan. We're going to return now to our top story. Graduates of Clarenville High have come together after 17 years in honor of one of their classmates. Paula Ryan was killed in a two car crash on the TCH Sunday near Bellevue, along with her husband and her son. Now the class of 2000 are focusing on the surviving member of the family, 13 year old Rachel Ryan. It is just tragedy. It's heartbreaking to have to go through this. But we have so, so much support, and that's what's helping. When all of this went down and we knew that it was Paula's family that was affected by this terrible crash, we all kind of quickly, one person made a message, one of our classmates, to kind of get a feel for the group, for our class and if we would want to do something. And quickly we were all reconnected and on board and wanted to do something big. So we all decided the best way to honor Paula would be to create a trust fund in her daughter's name in memory of Paula. Paula was a beautiful person, beautiful person known by so many. She had an impact on everybody that she met by her smile, her laugh, and just the person that she was. She'll never be forgotten. Just a perfect mother. She put her family first. Rachel is just so much like her mother, and I'm so grateful that we have her to hold on to Paula's memories, to let her know what beautiful, beautiful mother that Paula was. It's just kind of taken off more than we even had expected when we were trying to get it off the ground um, there last night and just get everything, the GoFundMe account up. We didn't even know what to set as a goal, and now that goal is almost reached today at we're almost to 20,000. So now we're just hoping to keep spreading the word and see how much we can get for this little girl as a little nest egg in face of such a horrible tragedy. Rachel is going to do wonderful in life. She has so much support. She is going to carry on like her mother would want her to do. She's going to be a strong little girl and she's going to grow into a beautiful, beautiful adult, just like her mom. Nineteen thirty five Chevy, just an absolute beauty. Later on here and now I'll introduce you to about two hundred people who drove to Victoria, BC and then to St. John's in their antique cars. Meet the coasters coming up on here and now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Hundreds of antique car enthusiasts dipped their wheels in the sea near Cupid's today. They call themselves the Coasters, and they trek from Victoria, B.C. to Newfoundland, and then they head back again. Here now's Anthony Germain took a spin to look at some of the classy wheels, and he met up with the group's leader, Fraser Field. Fraser, what would possess people to drive all the way to Victoria, B.C., and then drive from there to here in Newfoundland? Man and machine. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, everybody wants to do, but they're just not brave enough to do it. And we've got a uh, hundred of those brave souls with us here today. Uh, I'm halfway home because I live in BC and I've come to gorgeous Newfoundland and on a, on a, on a nice day to enjoy the weather and enjoy the, and enjoy the people actually. It's a lot of fun here, so. What is it about cars that uh, just gets to some people? Old cars, um, probably they, they have style. They don't look like a bunch of different colored jelly beans going down the road. These, you can say, oh, that's a Pontiac, that's a Ford, that's a Cadillac. Uh, with the newer ones, it's uh, a car. And some of the people here, they're from various provinces, right? They, and they all went to Victoria and then decided to go on this, this pilgrimage? Yes, uh, we have people from every province in Canada, and I think there's about four here from, uh, that came from Newfoundland, and two from the United States, one from Nevada and one also from uh, Iowa. And we all met in Saanich, which is just a little outskirts of Victoria, B.C., and did the 70 days one way here to Newfoundland. So tell me about your beauty. You used to be a paramedic, right? I was, I was a paramedic for 30 years. Uh, I've owned this car for 20. It's actually a, basically a rolling museum of what it was like in the medical field back in the, in the 50s, 60s, and into the early 70s. Um, I've had this car 20 years, and it's its third trip to Newfoundland on a, one of these tours. So. So what is it, a 1969? 1969 Pontiac Bonneville. Uh, the, the richer cities had Cadillacs and the poorer cities had Bonnevilles. And oh, you Pontiac. poor person. Yes, yes. The city I uh, first started in uh, 1980 with the ambulance service was Mission City, and this is an identical car to what they had. So the Coasters, who are you as an organization? Boy, the Coasters is a loose bunch of people that just get together every 10 years and go on a tour. And uh, the first one was in 1967 to celebrate Canada's 100th birthday and they ended an expo. And they it was to unify the car clubs of Canada together. Um, and they've had a, a tour every 10 years since that time. And the only difference was in 2000, we did one for the millennium. So this is the 50th anniversary of the first tour in 1967. Are there any particular cars here today that really stand out to you as, as, uh, as standouts, as beauties beyond others? Oh, there is. If you uh, take a look around, there's some absolutely gorgeous cars that would be in a showroom and not driving eight, uh, well, 8,000 miles one way. And probably, you know, you're looking at 12, 14, 16,000 miles by the time you come here and go home or left here to Victoria and come, come back. So there are some very, very gorgeous cars here. There seems to be a lot of people sort of laughing, having a good time, talking about cars, how much mileage, where they got their cars, that kind of thing. There seems to be like a fair bit of camaraderie here. We're like a, a large family. We've been together for uh, over 70 days with the days we spend in Victoria. And because we're camping in campgrounds, we're close together, we're enjoying meals together, we're doing car shows together, you get to be, li it's like a family. And we do have reunions every couple of years and we get about between 100 and 150 people will turn out for a reunion. Well, I know a lot of people, uh, everyone's going to be sort of uh, in Port de Grave tonight is going to be talking about that because you guys are rolling into Port de Grave. Thank you very much for your time and good luck on your way back. You're halfway home. Good luck heading back to BC. Oh, thank you very much. This will be Shield, Shield Maker home. Don't worry about that. Well, speaking of motorized vehicles, thousands of bikers from all over the world are kicking it into high gear this weekend. The annual Wharf Rat Motorcycle Rally is happening in Nova Scotia. And this morning, the CBC's Brett Ruskin went for a ride with one of the bikers. Here's his conversation with CBC News Now host, Suhanna Marshall. Suhanna, you wanted to see me in a motorcycle. I am in a motorcycle. This is the closest thing that I can be to riding a motorcycle without a motorcycle license. Again, we're here at the Digby Wharf Rat Rally. This is Beaner, by the way. Uh, met Beaner just a little couple of minutes ago. Hi, Beaner. Hi, Beaner. <laughs> He's uh, giving me... A a ride here through the uh, Wharf Rock Rally. Again, this is one of the largest multi-day motorcycle rallies in Canada. This is a town of about 2,000 people. Uh, there are 30,000 visitors who are expected to come here today. I'll give you a, a quick look at what it looks like right now. So 
this is the approach to the wharf here in Digby as we approach in a sidecar. So, uh, probably the first time that we've been live from a motorcycle, wouldn't you say? You know what? I think it's fantastic. What are people in the town think, think about this wharf rat rally? They must be happy. The economy must be doing well because of it. Well, certainly happy. I mean, in the early days, this is the 13th year. In the first few years, it was it was loud. There was all these bikers in. But now they're realizing the economic benefit that all of these bikers have. There was an economic impact study done in 2011 that found that there was about a $9 million injection of new tourism money because people are coming from all around the world, the United States, even from Europe as well. They're staying in hotels. They're eating in restaurants. And as you can see, as we go down this uh, main street here, there are motorcycles lining the entire main street. So again, here at the Digby Wharf Rat Rally, one of Canada's largest motorcycle rallies, reporting live from a motorcycle. You know yeah. what? It's only 13 degrees there. I can see you've got your CBC jacket on, which is great. But is it Beaner or Wiener? Beaner, yeah. Beaner. Beaner's, yeah, Beaner Beaner's, with a B. <laughs> Beaner's got no jacket on. He is one tough dude. He is a tough dude. <laughs> <laughs>While in Texas, people are still trying to put their lives together. But up next, we'll talk with a Newfoundlander who's helping clean up from Hurricane Harvey. Back to here now. For some people in Houston, the rebuilding has started, and they're getting some help from people here in Newfoundland. The Sunshine Squad is a group that came together to do acts of kindness to remember Alyssa Davis, who was killed in a car accident. Kelly Tilly is from St. John's, but for the last two years, she's lived down in Texas. She's been using donations from up here to help people down there. I caught up with her today as she was helping a homeowner clean up. People are going back into their homes, and they're realizing they got to tear up the carpet and get the gyp rock, um, get moldings out. Basically, anything that was under the flood line got to go so it doesn't spread. So that's what we're doing right now. And then in about two weeks, three weeks, when things start to calm down and those two first needs are met,
met, then along with the Sunshine Squad, we're going to start donating back into the classrooms. Um, a lot of teachers have lost their materials that they were using to uh, for the upcoming school year. And a lot of children have lost their... I mean, basically, they're back to school, school supplies. And right now, you're busy helping people tear out everything that's wet and uh, soaking yes. after all that flooding. Can you give me an idea? Yes. What does the street scene look like there as everyone does oh. start to repair? Well, you know, this is phenomenal because as I go to zoom out, you're going to see all the vehicles. And these are the people, just strangers that are just coming to these houses. So I'll flip now. And as you can see, here's the debris. I mean... You had to realize people have lost everything. Um, that's, I mean, dressers, wood, jip rock, cupboards, ceilings. I mean, depending on how far off the water went. And then over here, this is another house that was affected. So again, you're seeing, like I said, you're seeing the bits. Here you can actually see the studs in the walls that have had to be pulled out. Most of these houses are brick. It didn't help with the water, though. Right there, you're seeing underlay in the carpet. You know, people's personal dressers. It and as I zoom down the street, like I said, you can see the vehicles. We're, um, it's, it's pretty cool to see how many people are coming out and just knocking on people's door and said, we're here. We're here to tear things down and help you guys. It's pretty cool. So are the people that you're helping, are these people you know or are these just strangers? Oh, these are just strangers. And what's the reaction when you show up at a stranger's house and say, hey, I'm here to help? You know, these homeowners are so, they're so devastated. I, I think they're still in shock. I don't think they're, I, I don't think they can comprehend what they're going through right now. Um, their focus is to get the stuff out of the house. So, we're, you know, we try to limit our conversation with the homeowners just because we don't, we want them to be left alone, let them do what they need to do. They're trying to save more personal stuff like, you know, pictures, stuff like this to bring it to the second level. You mentioned the Sunshine Squad there. This was, of course, uh, something done in memory of Alyssa Davis, who died in a car yeah. accident in CBS. So what's your connection uh, to, the, I guess, this concept that's really expanded internationally now? Yeah. Um, well, my boys uh, swam with Alyssa. And Sherry Lynn, I got to know Sherry Lynn through the swim community, which is really, it's a small swim community. It's very tight. And she took a lot of our pictures and we just got to know each other that way. So, and her death, Alyssa's death really affected myself and my kids. And I just, I mean, Sherry Lynn's an inspiration to be able to, you know, to turn something so tragic around into something so positive. Well, so we're just helping out. So she basically, um, if they need something back home, I try to send money down to them. Um, she realized that we needed a lot, a lot of help up here. So she's got her crew together down there and they are sending donations left, right and center. Last night, we had a call that the National Guard that was uh, stationed at the KISD school district, or the actual school, the Katy High School, they had no supplies to uh, tend to their own wounds. So a lot of these guys have been out dragging people in boats, trying to save people, and their feet and hands were cut. So I took some of the money out of my account that the Sunshine Squad was after putting there, and we went, we found a drugstore that was open, thank goodness, because it was like 1230 at night, and we managed to get a bunch of supplies and we just brought it over and dropped it off at the where the National Guard is uh, stationed. Well, sounds like you're doing some amazing work there. I'll let you get back to uh, helping out that homeowner. I appreciate your time. Okay, thanks. Makes you feel grateful that yeah. no matter how bad our forecast may be this long weekend, we could be dealing with a whole lot worse. Yeah, and you know, so many times with these big disasters, it's in the news when it hits and then it's kind of forgotten about. And there's so much, of course, that needs to happen post uh, flood. And uh, so great story there. Yeah, and uh, although not everyone is able to get in their home, actually coming up uh, a little later in the show, we're going to talk to another Newfoundlander who still can't get back in because her house is still flooded. So. 
Uh, it uh, sounds like it's going to be the rebuilding. You know, this Weeks is going to be a story months. we're talking about for months, absolutely. Yeah. Now, sticking with the hurricane theme yep. from Harvey to the next one, we go from H to I, and this is Irma, and still a Category 3 storm. Uh, it actually dipped back to a Category 2 today and has now returned to Category 3 strength. This is a big storm, but it is way out there. When you look at the tracker, uh, over the next five days, this thing is in the middle of nowhere. It will wander westward through the uh, weekend and into the early stages of next week and it's not until Wednesday that it will start to approach the Caribbean. Now from there five, six, seven days it will then start to become a threat obviously for the Caribbean. From there there are still a ton of possibilities. There's a lot of different forecast models, there's a lot of different factors and of course a lot of days to iron this out. So any forecasts you see that may or may not bring it into Newfoundland uh, in the next 10, 15 days, uh, just keep in mind that there are a ton of scenarios that are possible with this storm uh, and we won't really know uh, where it's going to track beyond this until you know, at least early to mid next week. We'll get a better idea of where that uh, system may track, whether it's towards the U.S. and the Gulf or out to sea south of the island. All of those possibilities are still on the menu as of now. Satellite and radar closer to home right now. We are watching this new low, which is going to be rolling in across the island through the overnight tonight in through tomorrow. Periods of rain setting up over the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. That is, as I mentioned earlier, where we have a rainfall warning in effect. This low moves north, uh, northeastward tonight. By Saturday morning, you can see the steadiest rains are over northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador. Some showers and even a risk of a thunderstorm. Cornerbrook down towards the south coast. Risk of, a, of an early morning thunderstorm along the south coast. And that risk wanders up into St. John's and the Avalon for the afternoon. Also a risk of some thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon along the west coast. Winds shifting to northwesterly. And so that will have temperatures a little on the chilly side. Just 13 to 15 degrees through west and central barely double digits for the northern peninsula into southeastern Labrador. We're clearing out quite nicely across most of the big land tomorrow. Again, 15 to 16 in the southeast with some sun breaks, isolated showers in the morning. Better chance of some scattered showers and a risk of a thunderstorm into the afternoon. That all clears out by Sunday morning. Maybe a little bit of early morning cloud cover along the northeast coast in St. John's, but it's a pretty nice old day for everybody from uh, St. John's to Nain to Labrador City to Port of Basque. A solid, solid Sunday. This is the pick of the weekend. You're going to want to get out and enjoy it. A little hike, a little picnic. Uh, winds a little bit breezy still in from the north along the northeast coast. That is what will keep those temperatures limited to the high teens. Now as we roll into Monday, some building clouds through the day and that rain will start to advance. Certainly by lunchtime, I think we're into the rain for Cornerbrook down through the southwest coast. Latest timing brings those showers into central Newfoundland for the afternoon as well as Happy Valley Goose Bay. And it's a later afternoon, possibly as late as evening arrival from Cartwright to St. Anthony to St. John's with I think I think Metro even seeing a little bit of sunshine as we roll into the Monday morning time period that of course cl uh, cloud cover will bank up through the day with those again late day showers. Now the setup for next week low rolls off to the north. We have this frontal boundary that's going to stall over the eastern parts of the U.S. Looks like over Labrador, possibly western Newfoundland, but a big old southerly flow here. That's going to have temperatures on the rise, humidity on the rise as well. And for the central and eastern parts of the island, some sunshine in the mix too. So a pretty solid stretch Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe even Friday. You can see where the clouds are certainly a little more dominant in the forecast over western Newfoundland. It's really going to depend on where that frontal boundary sets up. Obviously some time between now and then that we'll iron that out. And for Happy Valley Goose Bay, eastern Labrador and west Labrador as well, it looks like that frontal boundary sets up pretty much overhead. So yeah, clouds certainly building up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday with a pretty good shower chances as well. Time now for our Young Athlete of the Day, and we have not one, but two athletes to introduce. Five-year-old Jackson Foster and Xander Rose. Uh, you can tell Xander, he's the one with the glove there. They're best friends who live in St. Anthony, and they both love playing t-ball. Congratulations, Jackson and Xander. You are today's Young Athletes of the Day. From those young athletes to another, we're bending our birthday rules for this week. 
for Boyd Morgan of Bay Roberts. Boyd's the one in the white and blue jersey, sporting number three, you can see there. Nice. Boyd Morgan turned 87 years old yesterday, and all the members of this Friday lunch hour squad are sending you best birthday wishes. I, so are we. I hope I'm that active when I'm that old. I'd like to be... Well, earlier you saw a pod of porpoises. Now, how about a six-foot shark? Brent Smith caught and fortunately released Bismaco shark while caught fishing last Sunday in Conception Bay between Bay Roberts and Spaniards Bay. Not necessarily the sea creature you want to be see circling around your boat. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Here and Now and back to Hurricane Harvey. The skies over Texas have been clear today, but for thousands of people affected by days of flooding, the future is less clear. Many in the Houston area are returning to assess the damage from Harvey. Furniture and other possessions are being dragged out onto the curb. They're mostly ruined by the water, and there's concern about contamination from dangerous bacteria. At least 46 people have died as a result of the storm. A lot of people still can't get home though. We've been checking in with Newfoundlanders and Labradorians stuck in the middle of all this damage. Jennifer Ivany Boisvert is originally from Grand Falls, Windsor. She explained to me what her house is like right now. People are going back into their homes and they're realizing they got to tear up the carpet and get the gyp rock, um, get moldings out. Basically anything that was under the flood line got to go so it doesn't spread. So that's what we're doing right now. And then in about two weeks, three weeks, when things start to calm down and those two first needs are met, then along with the Sunshine Squad, we're going to start donating back into the classrooms. Um, a lot of teachers have lost their materials that they were using to uh, for the upcoming school year. And a lot of children have lost their... I mean, basically, they're back to school, school supplies. And right now, you're busy helping people tear out everything that's wet and uh, soaking yeah. after all that flooding. Can you give me an idea? Yes. What does the street scene look like there as everyone does oh. start to repair? Well, you know, this is phenomenal because as I go to zoom out, you're going to see all the vehicles. And these are the people, just strangers that are just coming to these houses. So I'll flip now. 
And as you can see, here's the debris. I mean, you have to realize people have lost everything. Um, that's, I mean, dressers, wood, jip rock, cupboards, ceilings. I mean, depending on how far off the water went. And then over here, this is another house that was affected. So again, you're seeing, like I said, you're seeing the bids. Here you can actually see the studs in the walls that have had to be pulled out. Most of these houses are brick. It didn't help with the water though. Right there you're seeing underlaying the carpet, you know, people's personal dressers. It and as I zoom down the street, like I said, you can see the vehicles. We're Want to apologize that's uh, you already saw a bit of that interview that's kelly tilly uh, down in houston talking about some of the ways that she's helping clean up from all that flooding from hurricane harvey Welcome back to Here Now and Ryan. I saved this next one for you. Call this a corny tribute to the Toronto Maple Leafs. I like it. Ah. Yeah, this is a commemorative corn maze marking <laughs> 50 years since the team last won the Stanley Cup. Oh. Yeah, the New Brunswick uh, farmer behind the maze says it started out as a joke, poking a bit of fun at Leafs fans but uh, turned into quite a project. And of course, that's Austin Matthews on the left and uh, Mitch Marner on the right. Cool. Let's have a look at some of the people who are celebrating this week. Happy 60th anniversary to Fran and Dennis Halley of St. John's. Birthday greetings to Jim Ransom, who's celebrating his 91st, originally from Burn Islands, who now lives in Port of Basque. Sandy and Laverne Campbell are celebrating their 51st anniversary. Happy birthday to Joan Costello of Fairyland, who turned 92nd yesterday. Wishing Eliza Han of Stephenville a happy 91st birthday from your friends and family. Happy anniversary to Alan and Shirley Poole, formerly from Milltown, now living in Bishop's Falls. They're celebrating 57 years together. Happy 50th anniversary to Ern and Patsy Cavanaugh. Mrs. Mabel O'Quinn is celebrating her 93rd birthday tomorrow, formerly of St. John's, now residing in Shea Heights. Birthday greetings to Isaac Chamber, celebrating his 90th birthday. Isaac lives in Flowers Cove. Congratulations and best wishes to Donald and Ruby Bragg of Pillies Island on their 65th wedding anniversary. Happy 90th birthday to Netta Johnson of Catalina. She now lives in Bonavista. 
Happy 95th birthday to Gladys Knight, living in Mount Pearl. Birthday greetings to Edna Boone, who lives in Botwood and turned 99 years young on Monday. We hope Laura Moore of Clark's Beach is having a happy 90th birthday celebrating today. Congratulations and happy 50th anniversary to Maxine and Raymond Gouju of Cornerbrook. Happy 66th anniversary to John and Alma Hilliard of Cape Anguil. Happy anniversary to Art and Madeline Snow of Botwood, who've been married for 58 years. Happy anniversary to Marilyn and Doug McDonald, celebrating 50 years of love and marriage tomorrow. Happy 91st birthday to Gerald Burke of Grand Falls, Windsor. And happy anniversary to Hardy and Jeanette Lambert of Gander, formerly of Twinlingate, celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Wesley and Ann Shepard from Cornerbrook are celebrating their 54th anniversary tomorrow. Happy 55th anniversary greetings for Carl and Audrey Tuffin from Too Good Arm. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Art and Edna Payne of St. John's. Happy 57th anniversary to Stan and Doris Butler of Conception Bay South. It's a 92nd birthday for Emma Higdon of Cornerbrook. Happy 50th anniversary to Peter and Pamela Roberts celebrating tomorrow. Happy 60th anniversary to Ron and Elsie Simpson. And happy 97th birthday to Barbara Hopkins who lives at St. Luke's Cottage and still bakes goodies for family and friends. Sounds good. A happy 102nd birthday to William O'Keefe who currently lives in Placentia. Reg and Winnie Smith are celebrating their 54th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Happy 51st anniversary to Fred and Ruby Starks of Mount Pearl. Frank and Laura Blundell of Gander are celebrating their 56th anniversary. Herman and Stella Parsons from Stephenville Crossing are celebrating 70 years together. Raymond and Bertha Mitchell are celebrating their 54th anniversary. Happy 100th birthday to Muriel Anderson, originally from Makovic, now living in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Greetings from her children, 21 grandchildren, 37 great-grandchildren, and 24 great-great-grandchildren. And a happy 52nd anniversary to Des and Jeanne Dillon. And happy 50th wedding anniversary to John and Sandra Premier, celebrating their golden wedding anniversary today. That's it for us tonight. Have a great weekend. We'll be back with you here on Monday.